Okay, everyone, thanks for coming out again. I always say that, but this is about national security and, for the lack of a better word, planning. Now, this is very, very important, and we're going to go over some key concepts. Obviously, when the Trump administration, the former Trump administration, although some people say he's still president, we don't know, basically changed the national security doctrine from a more non-state act, a counterinsurgency, insurgency view, right, uh, to address these kinds of issues, particularly this happened, this change because of 9-11. So we started talking about more non-state actors. We changed some more state actors, right? So this is extremely important to understand. And that's what we're going to begin with, national security planning. What is it? Well, it's this isn't U.S. foreign policy, so we're not just going to focus on U.S., but this is for any kind of state or even non-state actors. But just using the United States as an example, obviously the Trump administration started seeing the rise of powers, China, Russia, Iran, etc., as being a quote-unquote threat to the United States, not the Chinese or Russians individually, but as state-on-state uh, powers. So we had a change, according to him, you know, or not him, but probably his advisors, to a more state-centric view of the world. That's very important, and that has to do with national security planning, because then you have to buy different equipment. Right now, we're going to have to basically balance China and the South Chinese Sea. We're going to have to balance Russia now after the invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, balancing is very, very important. In fact, you're going to see that where um, uh, the Estonia to balance Russia brings in NATO. And that's a whole balancing act. We're going to see that in the course. Then we're going to see another video, which is very, very similar, although a different time and different place. Cuba, after the revolution, Fidel Castro and the people he had in power brought in the, the Soviet Union to balance the encroaching power of the United States because it continued to uh, invade Cuba, not just the Bay of Pigs, but there was Operation Mongoose, etc. And the goal was to basically, you know, get rid of Castro. So Castro astutely brought in the Soviet Union, just like Estonia brought in NATO to balance. And this was before the Ukrainian intervention to balance uh, the, the uh, Russia, not the former Soviet Union. But um, this is very important. So national security policy matters. So now it's not just like the military equipment we buy are balancing uh, bigger powers, but it's also about how we train our military, our State Department, etc. So now you're going to train them in a different way. Before you were training them, and we're not in the military section yet, but in counterinsurgency tactics and on you know religion and politics, which we do this this week and a wide range and broad spectrum of things that have to do with non-state actor, Al-Qaeda, et cetera, now to more state actors, right? So Russia becomes very, very important. So we have to have more people that speak the Russian language. And that's in the Critical Language Institute, actually housed here at ASU, which is very, very interesting. So everything kind of shifts. So now the military equipment you buy is more state on state opposed to the stealthy, say, for example, um, military that you would need to fight uh, Al Qaeda because you need more human intelligence, etc. In fact, when we were using military equipment, lamentably, because it was a terrible war in both Vietnam and Cambodia, Henry Kissinger said to Richard Nixon, we're using military equipment not to stop these insurgencies, but to, be, to, to basically, you know, fight the Soviet Union. They're not fungible. That is applicable to this kind of war. And this becomes very, very important with national security policy. So it's not just about uh, the military equipment, but it's also training, right? Then you need people, you need to train people on how to use the particular equipment. And the United States, with all due respect, has never been very good with counterinsurgency. That is, insurgencies are coming and you have to stop it. I don't know if anyone has been, but if you took my U.S. foreign policy class, I show a cool short documentary on how uh, the Cubans, who really know counterinsurgency tactics, were actually sent to Angola in the 1970s and rolled back UNITA and all the U.S. and South African support in Angola, 
and actually defeated the United States and South Africa, two powers that were together in Angola in guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare, we're not up to that part, but that's basically, you know, kind of asymmetrical tactics of kind of slash and burn, taking out everything from lights, um, you know, in now internet connection, et cetera, and kind of creating more havoc to create instability and then maybe overthrow a uh, dictator or even democratically elected government. So basically, you know, these insurgents and many we support, many we don't support from a U.S. perspective, you know, do these kinds of tactics and you never know who they are. Uh, I'll get into that later, but I lived in Nicaragua that had a successful overthrow of the Somoza dynasty in 1979, and they use these types of tactics. But the United States has changed from a more non-state actor centric um, uh, national security doctrine to now a state -centric. And now with the Russia's uh, invasion of the Ukraine, it's it's very much more pronounced. So we're going to be seeing that in this kind of planning. And this also has to do with the third point I talked about, military equipment training, but also resource allocation. So um, the OMB that is in charge of that is now, you know, allocating money for different types of funding and you got to go through Congress and other things. And policy planning is very, very important and it really depends on where you stand in, in, in the world system. So you see behind me, I use this also in my US foreign policy class. This is Puerto Rico and I take all the pictures, most of the pictures that are behind me. And this is uh, Puerto Rico, you see that little um, twist of the R. So basically, you know, during Spanish Empire, they built all these castles, right, all over the place in fortifications, etc. You're going to see one um, in Colombia that I go into. But the question is, that was their policy planning, but does it work? So like walls are part of policy planning. So do walls and fortifications work? We're going to get into that later, but this is very, very important to understand because these fortifications were part of policy planning. Obviously, we won in the Spanish-American War who, where we defeated Spain. So, you know, although they had all these little castles and fortifications everywhere, you know, they still lost. So the policy planning was to kind of build uh, these... Um, big barriers up. And that gets into the question, will a wall work, right? That's part of policy planning. And is immigration a national security issue? You know, some say it is, some say it isn't. Some say it's like, say, um, more uh, oriented to, uh, you know, a human, let's say, refugees, like economic refugees, et cetera. So it's not really a national security issue. And others say it is. So it depends on where you sit. So I'm going to let you decide on that. But after when the United States became a world power, you know, we started with others, particularly after World War II, you know, the Marshall Plan. What was the goal of the Marshall Plan? The goal of the Marshall Plan, remember I'm from Boston, I don't pronounce my eyes. So the Marshall Plan was to send uh, not only food and money, but also military advisors, et cetera, to Europe in order to make sure they develop, Western Europe in particular, Greece, the UK, et cetera, and to help develop so fascism and communism would be less attractive. So that's a policy, right? So we have to start thinking what kind of policies do we want? And the other thing is, and this is why I, I talk about like the bureaucratic politics model, but I won't get into it thick here, but it also depends on who is important in a particular government. So during the, Bush, the Trump administration, uh, Bolton lost the bureaucratic war and Pompeo won. So Pompeo had a lot of um, influence on policy. So that's what, when you look at Biden, when you look at Putin, you know, you can't just look at these people when pol national security uh, uh, policy planning, you have to look at the people surrounding them because these are the people who are going to be making important decisions. Right. So like the Marshall Plan wasn't just Truman, you know, it's people around him that are making these policies. And that was basically a very good policy to get kind of East, uh, Western Europe on our side as Russia was expanding, etc. And remember, national security uh, uh, policy is not just limited to the military. It's economic. You see right now with uh, the high um, gas prices, right? Because we want to put sanctions on Russia. Western Europe wants to put some sanctions on Russia. Other countries can't, like India. So, you know, in their national security policy planning, they're basically saying if we put sanctions on Russia, we're really in trouble because we won't be able to have 
you know, oil. And that's a big national security issue, not just for the military, but keep, keeping the people stable, happy, etc. You don't want a revolution on your hands. And a lot of countries are not going in this direction against Russia because Russia, they know that for their national security policy planning, that, that economics, oil, gas, etc. is very, very important, not just for transportation, but also for um, heating, electricity, etc. We're going to see, is it going to be a cold winter um, in Europe? So this is what we're basically doing for policy planning. And the other thing is, not only states have policy planning, and I want to really stress this, but also um, non-state actors, like you know, groups, the Kurds. So start thinking about that. This is not a U.S. foreign policy class. It's national security. So all groups have their national security. So the Ringu people in Myanmar, which you're going to see that video, that's part of security, you know, national security policy planning. How do they protect themselves, right? And what does Bangladesh do with this? In that lamentable video that I give to a few classes, you know, and the reason why I give another article, you know, uh, uh, conflicts that we're not ignoring but kind of get overshadowed, attributable to the invasion of the Ukraine, because, you know, our minds don't work very well. That's why there's no more COVID, because once Russia invaded Ukraine, we're like, oh, well, we can't talk about the COVID. Now we got to talk about the Ukraine. We're not very good at being able to juggle many things in our head. So, you know, this becomes all consuming the Ukrainian crisis, but we forget about these other crises that are going on and the other national security policy that have to be in plan. So, we have to understand that other other states like Bangladesh, you know, the most populated country in the world uh, for its 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 territorial mass is basically saying, oh, no, we're getting all these immigrants in from the Myanmar crisis. What do we do? And then with national security policy planning, you have to ask other questions like climate change. Right. Is climate change a national security policy? And this becomes part of the national security policy planning. See, one video on national security policy is, is basically impossible because you look at like behind me, okay, during, you know, Spain's conquering of Latin America and elsewhere, and also we forget Equatorial Guinea, you know, their policy planning was creating walls, creating castles, et cetera. And you're going to see me in a uh, Colombian castle. And that's very, very important because that's what Spain tried to create. It's actually very amazing. And the same goes in Nicaragua, there's Rio San Juan, and they put up um, a castle there or fortification, whatever you want to call it. I like to call them castillos. In Spanish, they call them that a lot. But, you know, do they work? And the same thing for wall. Policy planning is about, you know, can we balance? Can we balance things like, you know, China or um, Russia? And then Russia thinks, well, are they balancing us? I mean, Russia then says to itself, well, we have our own national security policy, and that's that we don't get surrounded by the European Union and NATO. So Russia has its own national security policy planning. So it's very, very interesting to see. And then it's very difficult sometimes to see other countries and non-state actors policies, because if they do anything, we'll see them as terrorists. And this is what happened in Chechnya when the Chechens started attacking the Russian soldiers because they wanted independence. They basically, you know, were, were wiped out by the brutal military Russian army, although all armies are brutal. And then came, they came back, the, the many of the wives of the fallen soldiers in what we call the Black Widows to do quote-unquote terrorist attacks. But to them, maybe it's not a terrorist attack. So every country has national security uh, issues. In fact, I would even say, and a lot of people might not like this, and I say it in all my, in many of my lectures, like when uh, the Shah got overthrown in, in 1979, the Iranians took the U.S. hostages because that was part of their national security plan. They said, we're very weak. We just had a revolution. We've been, you know, beat up by the United States. They came in and overthrew Mossadegh in 1953. You know, our only card, I'm a card, I'm from Boston, is to get these, is to hold these hostages to ensure that we don't get invaded again. So national security uh, uh, planning is a very interesting thing that's taken from all sides. And one of the reasons why I had you read my article on Plan Columbia, because it's great because I wrote it, just kidding. You cannot like it if you don't like it. There's a lot of uh, lobbying in there. There's a lot of military industrial, you know, uh, complex in there. So like we're giving weapons to the Ukraine. Is that the policy or is it being pushed by like Lockheed Martin? And that has to do with policy, uh, national policy planning. And then other countries like Colombia, where I've lived, they were dealing with the FARC and ELN. These are guerrilla groups. That's the national security policy planning. But then 
them themselves, these guerrilla groups have their own national security policy planning. So you've got to really kind of think about this. So both states and non-state actors have these plans. And this can be very, very difficult to different uh, groups. And now, and it's not static because once you change the government, right? You get different policies. So now Colombia, for example, has Petro, a more center leftist. He sees national security uh, 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 planning as uh, engaging with Venezuela, although I don't think Petro likes Maduro much. He says, you know, we have the border with Venezuela. We have to deal with these people. So this is kind of like one of the things that's going on here is that, you know, it's also not fluid. It depends on who is the president. And this is important, but it's not only the president, but the people who surrounds the president. Right. Do you big build big walls like here in Puerto Rico uh, or do you like allow immigration or do you kind of do kind of deals with the country that you're dealing with immigration? And I think that's what Petro wants to do. The new president of Colombia, he wants to engage Venezuela in order to control the border, because I've been up in, in Colombia. Um, and if you see some videos of mine, just going through the rural area. I mean, it's no man's land. And that's why a lot of no women's lands, uh, a lot of. Um, trafficking, drugs, just a lot of bad things happen in, in borders, generally speaking, but in that Venezuelan um, Colombian border, and there's many of them, but Tachera there is very, very um, um, dangerous. And Petro is saying as a national security policy, we need to deal with that. But that's a lot to chew. I mean, it's, 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 it's not easy to go over it, but I want you to start thinking, you know, what are countries' national security uh, policies? And non-state actors like the Kurds have their own, the Palestinians have their own, Taiwan. I mean, this is one of the things. One time I was in Nicaragua and there was a lot of Taiwanese investment. And I said to the Taiwan, this Taiwan business person, oh, you're going to stay independent? And he said, well, if you keep protecting us. So this is one of the things. I mean, Taiwan's national security planning is basically dependent on us. And do we continue defending Taiwan like Nancy Pelosi went there? Or do we say, well, we don't want to get dragged into a bigger war? And that's one of the things. And will China, as a national security policy, invade uh, Taiwan? So these are like so many different questions. But it's very, very interesting. All I'm talking about is basically of these national security policies. It's non-state and state actors. You have different, um, let's just say, characteristics of these. You have money allocation, right? How do you, uh, what do you fund? You fund big military equipment, the more anti-insurgency. Um, it's the military equipment you buy, right? Like I said, Henry Kissinger said to Nixon, we're using, you know, weapons in Vietnam and Cambodia that is are, are created to fight the, the Soviet Union in one-on-one -on -one battles, right? So it depends on the military equipment you have, how we train our soldiers. Do we train our soldiers with uh, insurgency, anti-Al-Qaeda and things like that? Or do we train our soldiers more for one-on-one -on -one combat? And it has to do with policies, balancing, you know, how Taiwan and their national security, they want to balance uh, China. So they bring us in. Estonia brings in, um, uh, the, uh, Estonia brings in NATO to balance Russia, Cuba during that time brought in the Soviet Union, which created the Cuban Missile Crisis to balance the United States. So it's a grow. It's just a broad spectrum of different policies and investments, and both non-state and state actors actually have to do them. So I want to thank everyone for listening to my lectures, uh, trying to stay on track here. Uh, is it building walls, not building walls, how we deal with immigration? It's just such a broad spectrum of other things. So uh, I appreciate you listening, although you have to. And please, you know, write in the community forums any questions or email me if it's of the personal nature. So take care, everyone. And I hope everyone is enjoying the class.